Jai Hind, welcome to Dev Talks. This is Adi Achint. You know, I had this conversation with Commodore Anil Jai Singh, who's there with me today. Sir, thank you so much for joining me. He's an ex-submariner and the vice president of the Indian Maritime Foundation on the maritime affairs dealing with India. A couple of weeks ago, we saw the, you know, uh, what was touted as a very secret launch of the Indian nuclear submarine. That bring, brought about some questions with regards to submarine warfare that India would have to face or is challenging uh, the country today. So I've got Sir here to take us through the various different kinds of challenges as well as what could be required for India going in the future to have his force up and ready for the, for the confrontation upcoming with China. Sir, thank you so much for joining me and uh, taking us through this very intricate topic, which is not really discussed quite a bit in the open, um, submarine warfare, sir. Uh, good morning, Adi. It's always a pleasure to be on your show. I think you're doing a great service to bring about an awareness of matter security in the country. And I avidly really follow all your all your videos and I find some really interesting. I mean, I, I, I'm impressed by the amount of research you do before you sort of Put the program on the air. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. In fact, in fact, uh, you know, we in the military are happy that a little bit of traction, defense and security matters are getting traction now and people are actually listening into it. This is something that wasn't happening till a few years ago. Thank you, sir. Thank you for those words. I appreciate that. So, uh, you know, uh, getting on with the subject at hand, with the launch of the Indian nuclear submarine, suddenly the discourse of the discussion changed from a land warfare perspective to a maritime warfare perspective. And uh, a lot is being spoken of the over-the-surface capability of India and China, the, the various choke points and so on and so forth. India seems to be moving forward with the you know, submarine uh, division of its, its uh, you know, capabilities in terms of the naval power. May I request you to tell us what is the significance of the launch of this submarine uh, you know, for the Indian Navy, along with the various different kinds of roles that it can play for uh, our the defense of our nation, sir. Okay, firstly, uh, at the outset, let me first explain that there are three types of, primarily three types of submarines that are operating in the world. Uh, one is what we call the nuclear-armed ballistic missile submarine. It's nuclear-propelled and is nuclear-armed and is commonly referred to as the SSBN. Mm -hmm. Then we have the nuclear powered but conventionally armed uh, submarine, which we call attack submarines and are also known by the moniker SSN. And the third, of course, are the conventional diesel electric submarines or the SSKs, which are practically the bread and butter of, uh, of navies. And of course, there is a fourth coastal submarine, but that is not really, does not have an open ocean role of any kind. So I, I'll just make a passing mention to that. And of course, the fifth now, uh, Autonomous technologies. Now we're getting a lot of unmanned underwater vehicles coming into the picture of various sizes and to perform various roles. But that again is still in infancy. I'll just make passing mention to that. But fundamentally, I will talk today about the three types of submarines. And since you alluded to the launch of the third uh, nuclear attack, nuclear ballistic missile submarine that India did some time ago, uh, I'll just talk a little bit about that program. Now, India became a nuclear weapons power in 1998. Now, if, and the cornerstone of our nuclear doctrine is no first use mm. and credible minimum deterrence. Now, if indeed deterrence has to be credible, then you have to have a very uh, comprehensive retaliatory capability and a second strike capability. If you have to deter the other guy from launching the first strike on you. Since we have a no first use doctrine, it is very important that our second strike capability has to be absolutely 100% credible. Otherwise, we are vulnerable. Submarines are what is the third, the C vector of the so what so-called nuclear triad. There are land-based missiles, there are air-launched missiles, and there are sea-launched missiles. Sea-launched missiles are generally launched from submarines. And for a second strike capability, the most potent and credible platform is the submarine because the enemy can take out your land facilities, it can knock off your air facilities, your air bases, but it doesn't know where in the oceans, from how many meters below the sea and from how many thousands of miles away from the uh, enemy country, will this missile suddenly appear. Because there's a dive submarine going to fire it from somewhere in the world. So that becomes your most credible deterrent. And, you know, in England, in fact, 
the term deterrent has come to mean SSBN actually. When they, they talk of the deterrent, which is actually when they talk of the SSBN program. So that is the fundamental requirement for, for India to have SSBNs and a C-based vector for a credible second strike since we do since we have a no first use policy. Now for for the uh, C-based vector to be credible, you've got to make sure that you have one in the sea at all times. You can't have submarines going in and out of harbor and the enemy knowing that, okay, now for the next three months, the submarine is in refit. So India doesn't have a second strike capability from the sea. So to make it credible, you have to ensure that any given time, you have at least one SSBN on patrol, which the enemy doesn't know where it is. While one may be transiting back to harbor, one may be in refit, one may be going to its patrol station, etc. So to maintain a continuous, we call it continuous at sea deterrence. Mm. To maintain continuous at sea deterrence, a Navy needs a minimum of four SSBNs. So one is on patrol, one could be returning from patrol, one could be getting ready for a second next patrol, and one could be in refit. So to really be credible and to ensure that one submarine is always at sea, you need a minimum of four. India presently has one, Ani Arihant which we all know did a deterrent patrol in 2018. Now, that deterrent patrol proved two things. Firstly, it proved that we have the technological capability to operate an SSBN, to build an SSBN and operate an SSBN. That is a great capability because an SSBN is considered a more complex platform than a spaceship. Hmm. And secondly, it proved your command and control structure. Now, here you see the... Un for an SSBN to launch a missile from hundreds and thousands, thousands of miles away from your shores, hundreds of meters below the sea, you've got to have a very robust command and control structure. That means at that point, you should be able to tell that commanding officer, you have to launch a missile now. There cannot be a delay in that. There cannot be a preemptive strike. There cannot be a delay. So for that robustness of that communication, particularly when you're under attack yourself, you're, 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 you, know, you may have been attacked by a nuclear missile from somewhere. Your, your capital could be in ruins. So still to be able to deliver that second strike, you have, to very, you have to have a very robust command and control structure, a whole ecosystem, actually. So this patrol proved that we have that now in place. We have a national command authority. We have the ability to be able to direct our submarines to launch an attack from anywhere, anytime, on anybody. Mm -hmm. So I think those two factors were proved. Now we have to build the capability. So for that, we need four SSBNs, like I said. India has a program for four to five SSBNs. There's nothing secret about that. It's a known factor. And any country which has to have an SSBN capability will have a program for four to five SSBNs. Otherwise, it's meaningless, as I brought up. So we have one Arihan. We have a second Arighat, which, is, which has been under trials for some time and will probably get commissioned. If it isn't already commissioned, I really don't know. Uh, and what the news talked about was the third one, which is now undergoing, which has now been launched. So it will undergo trials for a couple of years till it is absolutely foolproof. You must understand the nuclear submarine is has a nuclear reactor at sea. Now, that is a huge, uh, you know, uh, a dangerous thing that you're carrying. It's, it's a nuclear reactor, a nuclear reactor at the end of the day. So, a submarine nuclear reactor firstly has to be miniaturized to fit into a submarine. It should be able to deliver power at all times. And it has to be foolproof against defects, against leakages, against everything. So, it's a, it's a great challenge. It's not like a land-based reactor. And therefore, the submarine has to undergo very stringent trials before it can be commissioned and actually sent on a deterrent patrol. So uh, the third boat will now begin. If it's been launched, it will take some time for fitting out. It will go for trials. So I, my, I think that by the end of this decade, India should be able to have a very credible second strike uh, capability with, a, with an operational uh, sea-based vector, submarine-based uh, vector operational. And we should be able to carry out continuous at sea deterrence. Just for your information, the UK in 2019 celebrated 50 years of continuous at sea deterrence. For 50 years, they've been able to keep one SSBN on patrol all the time. And so have the other nuclear powers, the US or Russia or perhaps even not, not China so much because China is now only in the last couple of years only really picked up that capability. But US, Russia, France and the UK have been able to maintain that for years and years and years. And we have to get there soon. So that is as far as the SSBN goes. So I just spent a little more time on that since you talked about the launch of that third ship, third submarine. As far as the SSN goes, now the SSN biggest advantage is that because it has nuclear propulsion, it is not limited by either speed or endurance because the nucleus it doesn't require refueling because there's a nuclear reactor. A nuclear reactor fueling cycle can be 20 years or 25 years. So 
you're not constrained by that. You're not constrained by speed. The boats can do very high speeds. They're very well armed. They carry uh, land attack cruise missiles, the Tomahawk everyone's heard about. They are, they can, an SSN is the ability to shape the maritime battle space in an open ocean environment. Now, that is a big capability a blue water navy must seek. And India is aspiring to be, or is a blue water navy aspiring to be the dominant maritime power in the Indian Ocean, as is China. So it's going to be a quite a seesaw game that's going to be played out in the Indian Ocean. The great, the big power rivalry is going to be played out in the Indian Ocean, not in the Pacific. Because China is constrained by an unfavorable maritime geography. It's got islands, it's got narrow straits, it's got narrow paths. It needs an open ocean space to really pursue its maritime ambitions and its global dominance ambitions. That open space it gets in the Indian Ocean. And the Indian Ocean is its gateway to the Atlantic. So the so the game is actually going to be played out in the Indian Ocean over the last 10 years, over the next 10 years, and India better be well prepared for it. The third, of course, is the SSK. Uh, there are only three navies in the world which operate all three types of submarines. The Chinese Navy, the Russian Navy, and now the Indian Navy. Indian Navy, of course, doesn't have its own SSN. We've been getting SSNs on leads from Russia. We are in the process of developing our own SSN program, which will take some time to mature. I'll maybe talk about it later. So SSKs are the bread and butter. They are the ones which are most effective in a shallow water environment. So if we have to operate, let's say, in the North Arabian Sea or the Bay of Bengal or off, uh, you know, off littoral waters of various countries against an impending surface threat or whatever, the SSK still remains the most potent and the most credible platform. So every Navy, it actually, is, unless it's aspiring to great blue water greatness, is actually looking at including SSKs in its, uh, in its armory, in its inventory. So we are one of the few navies which have which have, which operate all three because we have we require we have a role for all three like Russia and China have. America doesn't see a threat to its homeland. U.S., U.K. and France don't see a threat to their homeland, so they are operating nuclear submarines, and they have a NATO cover of other countries operating conventional submarines, so they don't need to have their own conventional submarines. For example, in Europe you've got Germany, you've got Italy, you've got Spain, you've got everybody operating conventional submarines. So that's basically a. Uh, why we need SSBNs and what this, what the meaning of this third SSBN being launched actually is, which you alluded to. Thank you, sir, for that great explanation. Uh, I, if I may ask you, sir, you know, we are also preparing for the battle of the seas at the end, at the end of it, which you also alluded to, which is going to play out in the Indian Ocean. What would be India's needs uh, going forward for dominance as what you, you know, put across in terms of its underwater capabilities? Look, India is the premier naval power in the Indian Ocean and has been. There has never been a challenge to India's maritime primacy in the Indian Ocean. It is the largest navy and we have we are known as a force for good. We are the providers of net security in the region. Countries in the region turn to us when they have a crisis developing in the maritime domain in the Indian Ocean. So the Indian Navy has a very credible uh, presence in the Indian Ocean. However, this presence is now going to be challenged by China for the very reason I said, because China will use the Indian Ocean as its gateway to the Atlantic and its gateway to marit maritime, global maritime dominance. You know, this is a typical Mahanian concept that the key to global superpower status is through maritime power. And it's been proven over, the, over, over history. The sun never set on the British Empire and Britannia ruled the waves. And after World War II, it's American domination, which has, been, which has led America to be the global superpower. Russia challenged it for a while, but the challenge fell apart after some time. And now China is following very much the same sort of philosophy in its approach towards global dominance by 2049, which was articulated in its uh, 2017 uh, uh, plenary congress and in all its white papers of 2015-2019, defense white papers. So India's maritime dominance in the Indian Ocean is going to be challenged by China sooner rather than later. The Chinese Navy is going for a very rapid expansion. Uh, they already are the largest navy in the world. They've got more than 350 ships in commission. They are larger than the U.S. Navy in numbers. However, they still lack the technological capability and the power projection capability to be able to operate, to maintain a sustained presence in far, in their, what they call the far seas, mm. which is the Indian Ocean. But they're trying to rectify that. So while they're building ships and submarines at, a, at an astonishing pace, they're commissioning 20 to 25 warships and submarines every year, year on year. They are not only replacing the old platforms with much more advanced blue water capable platforms, but also adding to the numbers. So by 2030, they expect to have a 450 ship Navy with at least a third of that, which means about 150 ships, which will be blue water cable, capable, which is almost the size of the Indian Navy. 
they have an aircraft carrier program they've already got two aircraft carriers the third one has already been launched or will very soon be launched it was supposed to be launched in end 2021 early 2022 their fourth fourth aircraft carrier will get built and they are building aircraft carriers in 3 to 5 years which is no navy in the world is able to build so fast so i am reasonably sure that once they have three or maybe four carriers operational aircraft carriers by the end of this decade they will position one carrier battle group permanently in the indian ocean because this is where they want to project their blue water capability not in the south not in the south china sea south china sea they will keep their smaller ships they have smaller frigates the corvettes because those waters require that sort of capability to protect the first island chain and the second island chain but when they have to come out into blue waters they will come out with a very powerful force now while they are building their navy they are also consolidating their basing presence their logistic support facilities in the indian ocean because china suffers from a fundamental vulnerability its only approach to the indian ocean is through very very vulnerable choke points the malacca strait the lombok strait the sunda strait if it tries to circumvent these straits it has a much longer route to transit mm. now as far as submarines go if the sub, if submarines coming from the pacific to the indian ocean have to come through these three narrow choke points they have to come on surface which means that their position is compromised you know that there's a submarine entering the indian ocean once you know it's entering the indian ocean you can keep a track of it there after even if it dives which is a great constraint on china's ability to operate in the underwater space because the whole purpose of a submarine is to be is surprise and stealth and concealment now if these three uh, elements are compromised then the submarine is little use to anybody so as far as china's ssn capability goes the nuclear attack submarine capability goes they've got six at the moment they've got six type 093 submarines they're developing a new class called the type 095 now once these submarines they have enough of these these are the ones which are going to come to the indian ocean and deploy in the open ocean space along with its carrier battle group as far as china's sskes go the conventional submarines now so far we were reasonably sure that they can't operate sskes in the indian ocean because they just don't have the sheer sustainability to maintain them in the indian ocean firstly they'll come all the way from the chinese mainland they'll come through these narrow choke points and then to operate in the indian ocean without any support facilities is going to be very difficult so we were reasonably sure they will they may send a submarine now and then but it's not going to be a sustained submarine presence in the indian ocean that is going to change that is going to change in the next 5 years for two reasons one they have already given two submarines ming class now they've got a they've got various types of conventional submarines of which the ming class are the oldest practically not operational submarines anymore they may be using them for some training or whatever they may be using them for but they're not combat capable submarines today so whatever little they've left they've given two of those to bangladesh in 2017 and they've given one to myanmar in december 2021 mm. less than a month ago or maybe a month ago 21st december if i'm if i'm not mistaken or exactly a month ago now the meaning of this is that not that they're arming these navies to take on the indian navy but using the kind of facilities they will get now because these submarines these submarines are old uh these countries are not going to build up their own submarine maintenance and support infrastructure for one submarine or two submarines so they're going to rely on the chinese that means there's going to be a chinese submarine maintenance presence in both these countries there're going to be chinese technicians there's going to be chinese expertise there's going to be chinese spare parts there's going to be everything available and china is also building a submarine base in bangladesh called bns sheikh hasina in off cox's bazaar so once that base is ready ostensibly for the bangladeshi submarines it means china will now have basing and support facilities for its own submarines operating in the bay of bengal mm-hmm. so even if it manages to send an ssk into the bay of bengal that ssk is not going to be constrained by the fact that it's already been at sea for 20 days it will enter one of these two places one of these two bases uh, undergo its routine maintenance and be able to operate from there as if it was operating from mainland china so in the bay of bengal we are going to be compromised as far as the underwater our underwater uh, our maritime security is concerned not only the underwater space now if you come to the west coast of india which is where india really has to maintain in a major dominance because most of our trade and a majority of our energy comes from the west western indian ocean over the over our sea lanes of communication in the west they are they have practically taken de facto control of godar port they are giving four type 039 which are their latest uh, submarines with air independent propulsion to pakistan they building four in china and then helping pakistan build four in pakistan so eight submarines why would china, pakistan a small country like pakistan with a limited coastline 
need eight plus Pakistan has its own three submarines from before. Why would it need 11 submarines? Obviously, it is a Chinese move to keep India under pressure in the North Arabian Sea. Plus, once you have, once China has given the expertise to build submarines, Chinese submarines in Pakistan, there's no problem for Pakistan to support China submarines also, the submarines which come from China, because it will have all the repair facility, it will have dry dock facilities, it will have every kind of facility to be able to support those submarines. So China can then position a conventional submarine force permanently in the Indian Ocean, in the North Arabian Sea and in the Bay of Bengal, which they cannot do today, but they will be able to do five to seven years from now. Now, this is something we have to be very, very careful about. So it is not only about the SSN presence, it's also about China's SSK presence, which we had discounted all this while, but will now be a clear and present danger because of our dependence on the Arabian Sea and the Bay of Bengal for our trade, for our maritime security, for our territorial integrity, and for everything else besides. So that is where uh, we have to be a little careful about uh, in terms of what China can bring to the underwater space. Now, how do we counter that? Submarines are not a zero-sum game. It is not submarine versus submarine. If you have to counter submarines, you've got to have a very, very potent anti-submarine warfare capability in your surface ships, in the air, in your submarines. It's got to be a multi-dimensional uh, anti-submarine warfare capability. That means from the air, you should be able to, be able to track your sub, the enemy submarine all the time. You should know where it is. You should be able to find it at sea. The ships are supposed to go and prosecute it with their helicopters, which are also armed. And the submarines are deployed against submarines very rarely because our the Indian Ocean hydrology, that is the, you know, the sort of temperature profile of the Indian Ocean uh, as you go deeper, is not conducive, is more conducive to submarines than to surface ships. That means the submarine operating in the depths picks up, a, can detect a surface ship at a far greater range than the surface ship can detect the submarine. So the submarine has an inherent advantage over a surface force. So you have to counter that, for which you need your helicopters, shipborne helicopters. You know, we're getting the Sikorsky MR-60 helicopter. That's basically an anti-submarine warfare helicopter. We had the Sea Kings earlier. So we need to build up a very comprehensive anti-submarine warfare capability, multi-dimensional, not only a submarine capability. Submarine capability, of course, is very important. What do we need a submarine capability ideally is for? To counter the Chinese submarine surface capability. When they have a carrier battle group, how do we ensure that we can contain that carrier battle group? with a potent submarine presence, with a potent Indian submarine presence. So that's how the sort of underwater game is going to be played out in the Indian Ocean in the years to come. Well, sir, That's something we have to be concerned about. Oh, absolutely. Uh, there's no question about that. You also tell us that, uh, you know, the, the Pakistanis and, of course, uh, Bangladesh, Bangladesh, of course, there's no direct threat towards India. But, of course, there's going to be a roundabout threat from uh, China, they're also trying to make that uh, deep port, uh, port in Kaikfu in uh, Myanmar as well. So you can Absolutely. see what you're trying to say, that they're trying to create their uh, facilities for them to be able to use something in times of emergency or times of war. Doesn't that actually augment or increase the kind of requirement that India would have in terms of its underwater capabilities and would also India need to expand the kind of capability or what we have and what we are working on would work uh, for a threat like this? Absolutely, Adi. You're absolutely right. We need to put in a lot of effort and a lot of resources now into consolidating our undersea warfare capability. And I'm not talking only of submarines. I'm talking from the air, on the surface, underwater, yep. and even unmanned. From a submarine perspective, you know, the Indian Navy submarine program has always been a bit of a seesaw program. It's, it's had very high, very major highs and very major lows. There is, uh, submarine induction has been a very sort of sporadic activity in India. We've never been able to consolidate long-term planning. In 1999, to, to, to sort of offset this, uh, the Navy had prepared a 30-year submarine plan for indigenous construction of conventional submarines uh, in Indian shipyards. And the plan was that within 30 to 35 years, we would have a force of 18 to 20 modern conventional submarines. That means by 2030 or so. Mm -hmm. That program has gone into... That has gone totally topsy-turvy. At the end of 21 years of that program, we only have four new submarines. So, and at best, we'll get two more by the time 2030 comes around. So, instead of having 18 to 20 new submarines, we'll have six new submarines and about uh, seven and I think four, about 10 old submarines. That's all our surface capability is going to be. Uh, sorry, our conventional submarine capability is going to be, which is grossly inadequate. Grossly and gr when I say grossly, I mean grossly inadequate. What we should have, so what the Indian Navy actually needs, 
Indian Navy needs a basic submarine force level of, of course, the SSBN, I don't count into this because that's a strategic platform. It is not a conventional war fighting platform. But we need those four or five SSBNs to maintain that continuous sea deterrence because, you know, your nuclear capability also influences your conventional capability. And how the conventional game will be played out depends a lot on what kind of nuclear strategic deterrence you are able to bring to the table. So that, of course, is an important element, but it's not a conventional war fighting submarine. What we really need is a force level of at least six SSNs, that is nuclear powered, conventionally, powered, conventionally armed submarines, for being able to patrol the Indian Ocean in its entirety against a Chinese capability of a carrier battle group. We should be able to deploy it anytime, anywhere. It should be able to match the Chinese capability, not for not, distance for distance. And not wait, not have to lie and wait for the carrier battle group to come. We should be able to take the fight to the enemy. We should be able to put bring pressure to bear on the on the Chinese rather than allow it to allow them to put pressure on us and we are reactive. That's why we need the six SSN force. It's required urgently. Now, as far as this program is concerned, we have been operating SSNs, which we have got from Russia. We got the Chakra, which has been returned. Another Chakra is coming. Another SSN will come in 2025. These are very complex platforms. And uh, these Russian submarines that we get will really teach us the complexities of optimally operating these platforms. But there is a program for six SSNs. It has been approved by the, by the, by the government in principle. However, the actual approval by the Cabinet Committee on Security is still awaited. Uh, but it will happen. The problem is any delay we had, that the delays that are taking place in getting that approval are going to have a cascading if down, downstream effect in these submarines actually becoming available. Because an SSN, if India is going to build SSNs on its own, the first SSN will take at least 12 to 15 years to build, not less than that. And that's an optimistic guesstimate. Even navies like UK, France, the US, Russia, which have been operating submarines for years and years and years, Nuclear submarines for years and building nuclear submarines for years take about 15 years to bring a new class into full combat capability. The astute class has taken about 15 years. The French Sufran class has taken about 15 years. So that is the sort of time we are building our first. We'll be building our first. So there will be a lot of challenges. So that means that by 2035, the earliest, I, I think the earliest we'll be able to get an SSN is not before 2040. Uh, an SSN capability, not one SSN operating here and there, but an SSN capability. Now, that is time. We don't have that kind of time. We have to get cracking straight away. That's as far as the SSN program goes. As far as the SSK program goes, we should have had a force level of 18 to 20 conventional, good modern conventional submarines with AIP, land attack, cruise missiles, etc., etc., by 2030. We are not going to have that. The Project 75I, which is now in the news, which is now going to be built under the new strategic partnership model of the Ministry of Defense, is supposed to be the, is the next program. Now, the way that is progressing, I don't think that submarine is also, the first submarine in the class is going to be ready before 2032, maybe even 2035, which means that till, 20, till the early 2030s, we will, be only, we will only have a force of six Scorpion class, which are being built at the moment, which also don't have an AIP system at the moment. Air Independent Partition is integral to submarine operations today. We don't have that. Maybe it will come by the in the later part of this decade if DRDO is able to get its system together. DRDO has promised that their system will be operational in a couple of years and it will be retrofitted on the on these Calvary class submarines which are being built in Malagon docks at the moment. But when that happens, we'll, we'll, I mean, when that happens, that happens. At the moment, we don't have the capability. Otherwise, we only have uh, seven old kilo class submarines and four old uh, two or nines, which are very, which are being kept very operationally sort of active. But, you know, age takes its toll in terms of capability, particularly with modern technologies, stealth technologies coming in, modern sensors coming in, modern weapons coming in. There are limitations on, on age. Age does bring its own limitations into a platform. So that's going to be an issue we're going to face unless we really get our act together and get cracking straight away. That is as far as our submarine capability goes. In the air, we are somewhat OK. We have the P-8Is, which have been a great uh, force multiplier. The PHI Long Range Maritime Patrol Aircraft, uh, it's a very potent platform. It's extremely uh, valuable. Uh, maybe we need to add more numbers to that, perhaps. But that is a call the Navy and the government has to take as to what is the optimum number we need. We need a lot more anti-submarine warfare heavy helicopters, what we call the Naval Multi-Role Helicopters, the NMRH, which we are now getting 24 from the USA, the Sikorsky MR-60. What we need is 100 odd helicopters. We only are getting 24. We already have a great shortage of these. You know, our new destroyers, the Delhi class and the Kolkata class and the and the Vishakha class, 
they can carry two of these helicopters each. Right now, we don't have enough helicopters to put on the ships. Now, that's a major, major capability limitation that we have. So once these 24 helicopters come, and hopefully more will follow, we will be able to build up some capability in the next five to six to seven years. But obviously, uh, still not adequate in my view. Uh, then, of course, there's the under unmanned technologies. We are certainly looking at unmanned underwater vehicles. A large now the now navies are going in for something called the XLUUV, the extra large unmanned underwater vehicle, which will even be armed with torpedoes. So we reach that level now of unmanned armed underwater vehicles. India is also uh, doing its own development. I really don't know what stage it's at. I'm sure we are moving ahead in a contemporary sort of environment. But these will be very useful, particularly at choke points. You know, And that is where we have to ensure that we are able to uh, nip the threat in the bud at that point itself before it becomes a bigger threat in the Indian Ocean. So these will be very useful. So there's a lot, ha lot happening in the underwater uh, undersea warfare space. We just have to ensure that we keep pace with what is happening. And maybe for that, we have to accelerate the, the entire process. I think we are lagging behind a little bit from what we should be doing, considering the threat that we are likely to face in the Indian Ocean in the next one decade. That I agree with. So there's a lot which is going to happen in the next couple of years in the Indian Ocean. And we can see the trickles of it coming up with the groupings that are being formed on previously known as the Asia-Pacific. Today, it's specifically known as the Indo-Pacific. So that's a lot that you've told us, sir, with regards what India requires in terms of uh, countering the submarine threat that we face from uh, China. Uh, another question does arise because, you know, there is a lot of development happening with regards, as you mentioned, unmanned platforms, which are going to, you know, uh, incorporate a lot of the AI systems. Um, what I would like to do is, without getting into specific details or giving out anything which is uh, confidential for that matter, where do we stand in terms of our current development? as well as the production cycle that we are in today, do you see us actually moving forward in a better speed than before or are we pretty much in a constant pace to match the threat that we face today? Sir? Uh, from an unmanned perspective, I think we are undertaking a lot of research activity. A lot of R&D is happening in the unmanned underwater space, mm -hmm. uh, as is happening all over the world. Uh, and I think the good thing is that while we are also trying to develop our own indigenous capability, we are open to co-developing and co-researching with foreign partners, more advanced technologies. So I think there is a clear understanding of where we want to be in the unmanned underwater space in a, in a, in a specific time frame. I really can't, don't know the real time frame that they're looking at. But certainly, uh, this is an area where the Indian Navy is paying a lot, is paying a lot of attention to. Uh, you know, the world is moving ahead very rapidly in this area. Uh, we started with small unmanned underwater platforms, which were, you know, which were configured for mine laying or mine, mine uh, detonation, etc. Now, the, now all the leading navies in the world are developing, as I mentioned, something called the XLUUV, the extra large unmanned underwater vehicle. The Americans are doing it with Boeing. They have something called the Echo Voyager. Uh, the Chinese are developing their own. They are developing something called a robotic submarine, which will be totally AI enabled. Uh, it was there in their, uh, it was, it's been reported about by the Americans also that they're developing the submarine, in which will have the capability of being unmanned and fire weapons, as I said. Uh, the Brits are doing their own thing. The Israelis are developing a large uh, XLUUV. So this is the next step. Because the, the XLUUV or any unmanned vehicle in the foreseeable future is not going to replace the manned platform. It's going to be a force multiplier for the manned platform. So one of the important things when you go in for things like AI is that the human element still has to be in the loop somewhere. You can't leave that thing totally to AI because the AI operates on certain defined uh, algorithms. In the fog of war, there are times some decisions maybe have to be taken for which you need the human mind. So that is very important. Secondly, there is also the ethical aspect which is getting more and more attention in, in artificial intelligence enabled warfare. Because... There are political and ethical considerations when you go to war. Now, who's to draw that line when it comes to AI? When there's a human element involved, you can draw the line. But when it comes to AI, where do you draw the line? So while in India, this hasn't got much traction yet. Uh, we did bring it up at a recent webinar, which I, which I had. I did uh, touch upon the subject. There has been a lot of uh, discussion and debate in, in, in global fora on the ethics of AI-enabled warfare. But as far as the unmanned underwater space goes, yes. India is uh, definitely working on it. 
uh, I am not really aware in the open domain. There's limited uh, knowledge available about what exactly is happening. But uh, I would I would think that the Navy, of course, is very aware of where the world is going, and I think enough is being done to address this issue. Now, in during the recent Commanders Conference, which was held in November, October or November 2021, uh, the Defence Minister unveiled an unmanned roadmap for the Indian Armed Forces. Hmm. It was, sorry, for the Indian Navy, an unmanned roadmap for the Indian Navy. Now, this covers not only the underwater space, it covers air, it covers UAVs, it covers everything. But the very fact that such a roadmap has been sort of developed and has become an official document released by the Defense Minister itself shows that there is definite intent and understanding of where we need to be on this. Now, this roadmap is presently classified, so it has not been released in the open domain. However, an unclassified version is being worked upon, which we hope in the next couple of months, perhaps by the time the Defense Expo comes around, would have been promulgated so that industry comes to know what is the Indian Navy looking at in a 10-year time frame or a 5 or 10 or 15-year time frame so that they can start uh, allocating resources, start researching those areas from now. So we are waiting now for the unclassified version, which is to come out in the open domain of what the Indian Navy's unmanned roadmap looks like. But suffice to say that this is an area which needs a lot of attention, and I think uh, we are paying that kind of attention to it at the moment. Now, how much we actually achieve in the next five to ten years, that depends on a lot of factors. And That's the world that. is going unmanned. Yeah. You saying, sir? I said the world is also going unmanned now, more and more. Hmm. And platforms like UUVs are very effective, you know, for... Firstly, they're multi... Uh, they're very flexible. Because you can reconfigure them for various uh, operational roles. Uh, they, they have modular construction. You can have them in a surveillance role. You can have them in a mine laying role. You can have them in a patrolling role. You can have you, the big ones can even be armed. So it's a very versatile platform you have, uh, which is which is what would be required in certain niche areas, definitely in the years to come. <clears throat> Sure. So that's that's at least nice to know that there is a roadmap and there is a thought process which is existing because uh, India is not with the lack of effort, but I guess the thought process gets missed sometimes in terms of uh, these kind of these things. But it's nice to know that the thought process is there. If that is there, things should be moving forward. So my last question the to you, you know, sorry, if I may add, the challenge in India lies in implementation. It's not in the it's not in the policy formulation. It's not in the thought process. It's not in the understanding. It's in the implementation where we are often found wanting. <laughs> Absolutely, sir. I hope that changes. I mean, of course, uh, for the good. So, you know, naval traditions are earned over years and years, decades and centuries of, uh, you know, navies being in active force. The U.S. has been dominating the seas since post the Second World War. The Britishers, as you yourself brought out, ruled the seas. Um, and there used to be this old adage that those who rules the ocean rules the world. Um, the Chinese on that matter, uh, I am not sure about their surface uh, force, but the submarine force is fairly new. How much would you kind of uh, gauge their capabilities in terms of their one experience, two time spent in terms of operational capabilities and operation, uh, having the forces, specific forces in operations? And what do you think are the impacts of having such a brand new force and to project the power that they're trying to do sir, today? Now, since you bring up the fact of, you know, navies are, take long time to build. Well, there is another adage which says it takes three years to build a ship, but takes 300 years to build a navy, which is actually a fact. The institutional strength of a service contributes greatly towards its ability to operate even in a contemporary environment. And yes, you're right. The, the PLA Navy is a very new navy. Till 1949, they did not have a navy. 1949 was the inception of the PLA Navy. And in 70 years, they have become the world's largest navy. So this speaks volumes for their technology, their shipbuilding capability, etc., etc., etc. But the rate at which they are building ships now at 20 to 25 ships a year, where are they getting the sort of manpower and the resource and the expertise and the experience to operate in a high-pressure environment? It's okay to operate in peacetime. Anyone can take a ship out to sea, do a few exercises and come back. But when really, when the, when the time comes, Will they be able to deliver? Will they have that operational experience of being able to operate in a blue water environment? That is a serious question that a lot of people are asking. For example, let's take the carrier capability. Now, the first carrier was Lioning. It was commissioned in 2012. They never had an aircraft carrier before that. 
And now they've got the Lioning and the Shandong, which was commissioned in 19, and they might have a second carrier commissioned by 23. Now, three aircraft carriers in less than 10 years or in 10 years. Aircraft carriers are very complex platforms. Aircraft carrier operations are very complex operations. You're operating aircraft off a, off a deck, on a, off a moving ship, which is not an easy thing to do. And the aircraft carrier is also a command and control platform in a network-centric environment. As you know, a former naval chief, Admiral Arun Prakash, who's a very respected name himself, a, himself a, a fighter pilot and who's commanded the carrier said, India has been operating carriers since 1961. Vikrant was commissioned in 1961. And 70 years later, or 60 years later, we're still learning. You know, every, every, with every aircraft carrier, with every new evolution, with every new development, you are further honing your skills. Now, the Chinese are very new at this game. So how effectively will they be able to operate this fancy blue water navy that they're creating when the really when the, you know when it when it comes to the crunch is something that merits discussion and attention but and i do see this as a vulnerability because you know having been in the navy myself and having operated in the submarines we also know how long it takes to really get your skills to that level which are required to be able to make the difference in a war in war you know so yes that is a challenge i'm sure the chinese are fully aware of it and they must be having enough, uh, you know, they must have thought of how to overcome this. Whether they are able to overcome it when the time really comes, how long will they take to do it uh, is, is a question that no, will only come, we can only answer at that time. However, I agree with you that uh, it will be a challenge for China to be able to operate these technologies with the same kind of expertise that, let's say, a, a U.S. Navy operates its carriers today. Yes, that's true. Yeah, of course. But because also, if I may add a caveat, please do not ever underestimate the Chinese. The worst mistake we can make, and you know, very often we do it. I know till 10 years ago, our, a lot of na senior naval officers say, oh, the Chinese, we've seen their ships, they're very old. It's all changed in 10 years. So we must never, one thing we must never do is underestimate uh, your threat, <laughs> effectively. You've got to give them the best and then see how you're going to tackle him. Yeah, and not may... assume that he's got vulnerabilities which which will not which will not have an which will which will you know not have an impact on the overall uh, outcomes. Absolutely. Fundamentally, yeah. Fundamentally, the Indian Navy has to ensure that it remains the primary navy in the Indian Ocean. Absolutely. And they have to, and the government has to do whatever it takes to do that. You know, ninety percent of our trade comes over the sea. Eighty percent of our energy comes over the sea. We cannot afford to be put under pressure at sea in the Indian Ocean. Absolutely. So I think uh, the nice and shiny ships that the Chinese have uh, may be a deception, may be true, whatever whatever it may be. But we, I think the conversation should not veer on towards that side, but to veer on the factor that we must plan that they are damn good and become better ourselves right. so that we can counter the threat which is required. If they are bad, fair enough, we'll become stronger than them. There's no harm in that. I don't think there is any problems in becoming a good naval power or a good force that yeah. can, you know, secure its own interest within the Indian Ocean. At the end of it, it's named after India. So, thank you so much. I mean, this has been an, a very, very simple eye-opener. Let me be very clear because submarine warfare and submarine requirements, submarine talks are something that have been not discussed in the wide open media because one of the reasons is that people don't understand it. It's a very technical space. It's it involves huge amount of systems and a basic understanding of uh, waters and the underwater, you know, warfare system as as per se. It's it's a very very difficult thing to understand. And of course, I I also understand the best of the best and go into the submarine forces because it demands that from you. I do hope what you say in terms of uh, what capabilities that India needs to develop is being done today. Uh, I mean, I don't want to get into the specifics of what is being this and that because it's not something that we're wanting to discuss here. But I do hope that what you're saying is being put into action and we see ourselves as a good force somewhere 2035, 2040, um, dominating this part of the ocean and not letting China finger around within our business. As I said, sir, thank you so much for the preparation, for the talk. And till next time, for another subject on another day, sir. Jai Hind. Jain Adi, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you, sir.